Good morning, everybody. ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Menchev here with another look uh, at the latest water numbers here in Northern California. We have not had any more rain since the last time we did this video last week, uh, so we're still above average for the month, but not by as much, only about a tenth of an inch, just less than that. For the season, we're now about three quarters of an inch below where we should be. This is a Sacramento executive, but the water here started on October 1st and ends at the end of this coming September, uh, so we still have lots of rain to come. Fingers crossed it's a lot of rain to come uh, before the water year is over. So still time to work on the drought. Speaking of the drought, the latest numbers are in. All the winter storm numbers are finally here. So on this drought update, everything that we saw at the start of the month is now on this map. And we see some improvement right off the bat with the exceptional drought category. Now 13% of the state has, is in that exceptional drought. That is an improvement. We've seen a little bit of it, especially south of Fresno, between Fresno and L.A., uh, just a little bit, not a whole lot. Extreme drought category went up a couple percentage points. That's because, though, that's a downgrade. So it went from exceptional to extreme. So that extreme drought category, 28% of the state, 44% of the state in the severe drought category. That's that orange color. Had a little bit of work done uh, on it but, uh, near Los Angeles as well because of that rain. They saw a lot of rain down in Southern California uh, to start their water year. We saw some rain up here, too, but again, uh, not a whole lot, not enough to really make a huge dent in, in that drought up here in Northern California. But putting the map side by side, this is where we were last week without all the winter storm numbers on the map. And here's where we are this week with now all the winter storm numbers uh, put in there. So again, not huge improvements across the board, uh, but it is good to see that we've got, we've got some work done on that exceptional uh, drought category. Again, it went from 17 to 13 percent and even though the extreme category went up that's more uh, because that exceptional category went down so again that's a downgrade from five to four uh, and you see that there on that map so before we get any further uh, into this uh, this little climate update I want to talk more specifically about climate change because COP27 uh, the United Nations climate conference it just wrapped up in Egypt at the end of last week uh, and there were some some things talked about there uh, that really could make a big improvement, including starting a fund uh, for mitigating the impacts of climate change and helping smaller nations. Uh, that, that's a big deal. Uh, and that's one of the things that came about from COP. But before we talk more about COP, why is a meeting like that important? Well, because we are seeing the effects of climate change right now. It's not 10 years down the road, not 50 years down the road. It's right now. It's happening now, and we're already seeing it. Uh, and you can see that if we don't do anything and we just continue to put out a bunch of emissions, again, unmitigated, uh, it's going to warm up significantly. This is a map for Sacramento, and you can see that observed temperature just continues to tick up. And especially in, over the last 50 years, it's really climbed. Right now, that average temperature uh, over the course of the year is between 62 and 64 degrees, uh, maybe about 63. But uh, by the end of the century, about 2100, again, if we don't do anything, that average temperature, this is accounting for lows and highs all year round, the average temperature would be over 68 degrees. With significant cuts, we could keep that below 66 degrees. It's not just here, though, uh, in California. It's across the map, especially in the United States. We can see these numbers uh, with continued emissions, unmitigated we can see especially that upper Midwest region, six degrees or so of additional warming by 2100 on average. That's for your average temperature. It's, it's not good if we don't see significant cuts. Here's what a map with significant cuts looks like, and it's not nearly as bad. We're seeing only about two to four degrees of significant warming. So I don't know about you. I'd rather have this map by the time we get to 2100 than this map. That one's a lot worse. Uh, we can actually start to tie, though, climate change to certain weather events, and we can say that certain weather was made worse by a changing climate, and that's a big deal. That's something we haven't been able to do up until fairly recently, and this is in large part thanks to the work being done uh, at Climate Central. You can go to Climate Central uh, and at their website, and you can see all the information. You can pull all these maps. These are straight from Climate Central. I have not edited these in any way. You can look at the exact uh, map that I've got here behind me. You can read articles about it if you want more information. I highly recommend checking out Climate Central uh, if you, uh, you want to know more. Uh, but again, talking now about how we can kind of put some fingerprints, uh, that we can see those fingerprints from climate change. This is on summer nighttime low. So this is your low temperature uh, over this past summer. Uh, in areas uh, that you see in the pink purple colors, 
the number of days, so that's up to 70 days. So fingerprints of climate change, how much can we see climate change over nighttime lows this summer? Well, certainly over the de desert southwest, over 50 days, closer to 70 days for parts of Nevada, most of Nevada, in fact, including Texas, uh, the Gulf Coast. We can see that here, but we even see it in the Central Valley where 30 to 50 days uh, of our summer, our summer lows were made worse by climate change. Now, Climate Central came up with a me method called the Climate Shift Index to really see just how much and to put a number on just how much climate change uh, is impacting things such as the average high temperature, the average temper, the average low temperature. And the way it works is with the past climate, you see that kind of in the faded bell curve here behind it. The extremes, well, the extreme cold happened and it happened less frequently than your normal temperatures in the middle of the bell curve. And then your extreme heat happened even less frequently. But with climate change, this is shifting. So in the bell curve in front, the one that's colorized, you can see how that shifted. So now the extreme cold events are very rarely ever happening. They're not inside that curve. Warmer weather is much more common compared to the past climate. And then that extreme heat, which almost never happened in past climate, of course it did, but it's happening more frequently now. And that is because of a shifting climate. So if a 90 degree day, this is uh, just a generalization, not necessarily for Northern California, but if a 90 degree day uh, maybe only happened once uh, every so often in the past climate, well now with that shift in the climate change, now we're seeing well, now that 90 degree day happens three times more often, so that gives the index uh, a number of three. So now we're looking at climate shift index plotted uh, onto a map of the globe. And so this is a, at 365 days of climate change. This is your average daily climate shift index for the globe. And you can see areas in red have a much higher shift index. Well, no surprise here, desert southwest, even into the mountain west, parts of California are in that red color deep red colors for Mexico, Central America, for Brazil and the Amazon. That's a big deal. Uh, the Saharan Desert, the Middle East, deep red as well. Uh, Australia, but you also notice Antarctica is all shades of red. Same with Greenland. And that's, uh, that's a problem because we store a lot of ice in both Antarctica and Greenland. There is some hope, though, and it comes both from COP, which we'll get to in a second, but also from something that happened earlier this year. The Inflation Reduction Act was passed here in the United States, and in it, it contains over $300 million to help towards climate change. And so some of the cuts that we're going to see here uh, due to the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of that's going to come from power, from electrical grid, from transportation, non-CO2 greenhouse gases, all things like that we're going to see cuts in thanks to funding coming from the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, to, to give more on Climate Central, the work that they're doing, uh, what COP is and all about, I actually went straight to the source. I talked to Chief Meteorologist at Climate Central, Bernadette Woods Plackey. She just got back from Egypt, and here's what she had to say. I think so much gets lost in the COP process of some of the headlines, you know, this is the worst ever, this doesn't, but it's a couple of things at once. It's, it's moving things forward but it's not enough yet. And that's where I think that it is, it gets messy because people want a simple answer and it's not a simple answer. The reason that this is important is because we have this global issue of climate change, but we don't have a global government. So we need to have a framework or a system that can bring everyone together to move this topic forward. And what's critical at this meeting is that all countries have a voice. It slows down the process and it is imperfect in some of the practices and policies it works through. However, it brings everyone to the table. The United Nations Climate Change Conference of Parties, COP, is exactly the place to try to find answers to difficult climate change related questions. A changing climate that we are seeing appear in more ways in our everyday weather. The science has gotten to a point combined with the ability to advance our technology and computing capacity that we're at the point where we can attribute daily temperatures now everywhere around the entire globe to climate change. And Climate Central has put out what's called the Climate Shift Index. This is a tool that looks at the globe everywhere, every day, and can look at the, the role of climate change within our daily temperatures. And where there is good news with all of this is solutions to our climate change challenge are advancing rapidly. We are producing so much more renewable energy now than we ever were. 
electric vehicles and our ways of moving people around are changing right in front of our eyes from month to month. The way we get our food and move our food around is changing. The way we build our buildings, it's changing. And so we are seeing great advancements in our solutions. However, the warming is still happening faster. So what we need to do is really scale up these solutions at a pace we've never seen, but that's what's needed to keep us to that 1.5 degree goal. So it's not all bad news, but significantly more work needs to be done. Does that mean it's too late? That's a loaded question. And the reason I say that is because how do you view too late? Unfortunately for the people who have already lost their lives to the wildfires in California, or the devastating hurricanes that we've experienced across the United States, or the floods in Pakistan, it is already too late for them. However, when you look at the big picture, the global goal is to limit warming to two degrees Celsius with an aspiration of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're at about 1.2 degrees Celsius right now. So there's still a little bit of room there. We have to factor in scientifically that all of the greenhouse gases and emissions that we're putting into our atmosphere right now stick around in some form for hundreds of thousands of years. So what we're putting out today already bakes in a couple of tenths of degrees of warming. So when you put all of that in perspective, the conversation really is around that 1.5 degree target. Is it still possible? And it is technically still possible, but the window's closing pretty rapidly. If you look at where we're heading globally, when you factor in the new laws and the commitments that have been made, it's bringing us to about 2.8 or 2.6 degrees Celsius. Now, there's a couple of different ways to calculate, but that's generally the range. If you squeeze out all of the verbal commitments and pledges that countries have made around, around the entire world, but they're not really put into policies quite yet, you can bring down that warming trend to about maybe 1.8 degrees Celsius, some of the calculations go. So that brings down that warming real area closer to the goal of 1.5. However, you still see a gap. Here in California, a solution implemented earlier this year requires by 2035 that all new cars sold are powered by renewable energy. And that's a big deal because the transportation sector is a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. The biggest sector is transportation. A very close second is in general power, how we get our electricity and how we use it. Those two sectors alone, if we already have solutions in place between the, the, the evolution of electric vehicles and how they are growing so rapidly with people really starting to implement them. And then wind and solar and hydropower and how that plays into this. These are things that already exist. And if we could scale those, we can take care of 60 to 70% of our emissions right now in the United States. And that would buy us some time to really learn how to do the harder things how to fly planes around, how to transport things by ship across the world. So there's a lot that has to go into this, but if we can scale what we know works now, it buys us extra time for the other things. And so that's why it is really critical to look at where our missions come from and what we can implement right now. So knowing all of this, knowing about the work that lies ahead and the perils should we fail, how does our climate change expert feel about the future? I feel energized and I'll tell you why. It's the people. It's the people that are in this work. It's the people who are so committed to trying to solve this crisis. And it's the people that we're trying to help, that we're trying to keep safe and prepared from our changing climate and our changing weather and our changing water systems and our rising seas and our worsening air quality. But it's really about the people. 